this uh, Good Friday. Uh, just a little bit earlier, uh, Sandy heard some chimes. Well, it was my it was my emergency thing going off of the phone because we got a notice. Uh, there's an active shooter situation at Bucknell right now. It started around 6.35, and they closed everything down. And so then my wife is trying to get a hold of me because my son, who helps with the men's soccer team there, they're locked in the locker room there because uh, there was to be a game tonight. So if anybody hears anything, please let me know as soon as possible. Now may the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask you to look with mercy on your family. A reading from the 52nd and 53rd chapters of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, and acquainted with infirmity. As one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of the people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain when you make his life an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. and He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. From the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. This is the covenant I will make of them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. But also, he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, 
There is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. For if we willfully persist in sin after having received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Again, may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Congregation may be seated. The passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? 
Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against this man, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you? power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, would I have written? I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven 
in one, plea, one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, by night also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now may we sing together hymn 316, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded.
see that? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For Christians, this has to be one of the most difficult days that we experience in the church year. It's a day of suffering, a day of humiliation, a day in which people who should have known better decided it would be okay to exchange a bunch of lives. It was a day, again, in which other people who should have known better decided to make a mockery of this whole situation. They became mean-spirited, spit in Jesus' face. They hit him. They paraded him around in a crown of thorns and a mock robe. Throughout most of this, Jesus kept his mouth shut. Yes, there were a few times where he also asked questions. There were times when he indicated that he's here to reveal the truth truth of God's way, the truth of God's purpose, the truth of God's future. What were their motivations? Was it fear? Did they just not like him? What were their motivations? It was supposed to be a joyous time in Jerusalem. It was the day before the Passover celebration. People came from territories near and far. They came to Jerusalem for the festival. That's why Pilate was in town. Normally, Pilate's headquarters were at Caesarea. But because of the festival, he brought much of his military cohort into Jerusalem with him. And then people who should have known better started to make up lies about Jesus. Again, what were their motivations? hear the sounds of flesh hitting flesh. We might be able to visualize the blood running down the forehead. We might even hear the sounds crucify him, crucify him. From a very early age, I always wondered why they called this day good, Good Friday. Because as I became familiar with the passion stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was hard to see anything good out of this. It was about lies and violence, mockery and humiliation. It's not about the truth at all. And yet we have come to call this day Good Friday. I believe that John's gospel gives us several hints throughout the gospel why we might be able to proclaim this day good. 
begins when Jesus began his public ministry. And people in the Galilee region witnessed Jesus. And they wondered who this Jesus might be. So they asked another good guy, John the Baptist, who is this guy? He's the Lamb of God. Takes away the sin of the whole world. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the whole world. One of the first stories that we hear in John's Gospel He pronounced forgiveness to someone who had been ill for quite some time. And then later, as he continued to teach his disciples about the truth of God, what God has in store for humanity, Jesus began to talk about love. God's kind of love. God's kind of love that reaches out to the whole world. We know that passage. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus continues to teach about love. When some of the disciples seem to be a bit discouraged about where all this might be leaning to. But already opposition to Jesus seemed to be spreading throughout Judea. Jesus again said something about love. No greater love as anyone than to lay your life down for others. That's the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. And so we get to the passion story. The passion story that begins with Peter saying that, yes, Jesus, I'm with you the whole way. And even if I have to die with you, I will. Again, another lie. Because when it started to get a little dangerous for Peter, he denied, denied even knowing Jesus. Yes, it's Good Friday. But it's also a Friday filled with betrayal and denial and lies and hurt, and suffering. But John's gospel wants us to know. And Jesus again gives a hint to it before Pilate. Pilate says, you know, I'm the governor of Judea, and I have this power, this power that if I wanted to, I could kill you. And Jesus said, you wouldn't have any power over me unless it was given to you from above. Jesus prayed that prayer a little bit earlier in the gospel where he says, the Father and I are one. One together, one in will, one in purpose, one in hope. Jesus resoundingly said before Pilate, if my kingdom was of this world, there'd be some more violence out here in the streets. But as it is, that's not what I came to show. I came to reveal God's love and the fullness of that love. And Jesus was willing to bodily express the fullness of that love. We all know that he could have stopped this at any time. 
But remember, he said, no greater love hath anyone than to lay one's life down for others. It's Good Friday. It's Good Friday because Jesus laid his life down for us. It wasn't the chief priests. It wasn't Judas. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't Pilate. It was Jesus. It was Jesus who laid his life down in the face of so many different examples of human sin. Jesus laid his life down for each and every one of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that all who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Tonight, we can look at that picture. And the cross is empty. The cross is empty because the chief priest, Pilate, no one else could keep Jesus down. And tonight, the fullness of God's love, the fullness of Jesus' love, has come to us, embracing us with life and life everlasting, enabling us to experience the fullness of that which God and God alone can provide. So as difficult as it may seem, this Friday is good, and it is good because Jesus loves us, and nothing will turn Jesus away from that love for us. Not the Judases of this world, not the pilots of this world, not the chief priests of this world. No one, no one can take Jesus from us. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free in Jesus' love from a past that we cannot change. And in Jesus' love, open us to a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Therefore, let us pray, sisters and brothers, for the Holy Church of God throughout the world, that God may guide it and gather it together, so that we may worship God in peace and tranquility. Almighty God, eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations and all peoples in Jesus Christ. Guide the work of the church. Help it to persevere in faith, to proclaim your name, and to offer salvation to people everywhere. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us pray for pastors, ordained ministers, and for all servants of the church for all people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold all pastors and all leaders of the church. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help each of us to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us now also pray for those preparing for baptism, that God may make them responsive to God's love and give them new life in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, 
You continually bless the church with new members. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them a new birth as your children. Keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. And now let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that the light of the Holy Spirit may show them the way of salvation. Almighty and eternal God, enable those who do not acknowledge Christ to receive the truth of the gospel. Help us, your people, to grow in love for one another, to grasp more fully the mystery of your Godhead, and so to become more perfect witnesses of your eternal love in the sight of all people. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us also pray for those who do not believe in God, that they may find the God who is the author and goal of all our existence. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all might long to know you and have peace in you. Grant that in spite of the hurtful things that stand in their way, all may recognize in the lives of Christians the tokens of your love and mercy and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God of us all. We ask this through Christ our Savior. And let us pray that Almighty and merciful God may heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and rid the world of falsehood, hunger, violence, and disease. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Savior, who himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Behold the cross on which hung the salvation of the whole.
Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. And the Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy and love. May the Lord look upon us with favor and grant us everlasting peace.